The 8th Air Force was stationed in England and its primary task was to fly B-17s on daylight raids over occupied Europe. On board each flying fortress were 10 crewmen. They had to complete 25 combat missions before they earned the right to return stateside for good. On the completion of their bombing mission on May 19, 1943, the members bell of the 91st Bombardment Group was recognised as one of the first B-17 crews to have completed a combat tour. During the course of her 25 combat missions, the crew of the Memphis Bell shot down eight German fighters. Two pilots sat above and behind the nose section with a clear view of the engines on each wing. These were dangerous skies because German BF 109s were ordered to stop the squadrons reaching their target at all costs. The flying fortresses followed a common bomber doctrine of the time in that the squadrons were arranged in what was known as a box formation. Flying at 25,000 feet, the formation was made up of multiple bombers flying within close proximity to one another. Behind the flight deck is the dorsal turret, consisting of twin Browning .50 caliber machine guns manned by a single operator who also doubled as the aircraft's in-flight engineer. To protect the aircraft from rear fighter attacks, there were twin machine guns manned by a tail gunner. The powered belly turret was set into the floor of the fuselage. It also was equipped with twin .50 caliber machine guns. Near the belly turret, two waste gunners manned .50 caliber machine guns on both sides of the aircraft. The aircraft improved as different tactics by enemy fighters took their toll. And with each upgrade, the B-17 would be tagged with a new letter. The B-17G now supported the Bendix installation in the chin turret below the bombardier's position. When the enemy interceptors stopped attacking the formation, it was a sure sign that extensive ground-based flak was about to follow. The seemingly random nature of the flak was truly terrifying, as the bomber formations were required to hold course while entering into what is essentially an aerial minefield. During the bombing run, the pilot would transfer lateral control of the aircraft to the bombardier, who was positioned at the front end of the fuselage with a commanding view of the action ahead. Bomber flights frequently followed the lead aircraft and would drop their bomb loads on his queue. The introduction of the Norden bombsite was instrumental in gaining better accuracy for the bombers. The responsibility of the lead bombardier was to make absolutely sure he was over the correct target. Unfortunately, improvements in design did not make the B-17s invulnerable to enemy attack. Other B-17s with battle damage were able to keep flying, and on many occasions, a badly hit bomber was known to limp back home with entire sections of the aircraft missing. <laughs>